Welcome everyone to tonight's event in our three-part series featuring the GILT Group. We're the New York Technology Council. I'm Eric Garoon, Executive Director. And tonight we'll be talking about personalization and flash sales. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second, but first let me give you a brief introduction to NYTEC if you're not familiar with us. And if you are, please bear with it again. We're a nonprofit organization. We'll be four years old this month. Uh, we work with the New York technology community, trying to get people to talk to each other, learn from each other, and, and get to know each other. We have a number of sponsors. These are our annual sponsors. Uh, we would not be doing this without their support, so I want to acknowledge uh, how much uh, assistance they do provide us. The list is growing, growing rapidly. We hope to see it continue to grow. And at this point, let me uh, have Lori Apple come up. Uh, she's here with Gilt, and she wants to say a few words to you. Oops. Hi, I'm Lori Apple. I'm the Tech Evangelism Specialist here at Gilt. Um, welcome. Uh, thanks for coming out. And uh, we're doing a lot of, it, of tech events uh, now, so and you can find out about those on our Twitter feed, which is at Gilt Tech. And we also have a Facebook page, which is facebook.com backslash Gilt Tech. And our tech blog, where you can find out more in, in depth about uh, the technologies that we use and how we use them. And that's tech.gilt.com. I'd just like to uh, say that we have free technology courses here at Gilt. We open our doors to the public. They're all day courses. Thanks. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you. So uh, let me introduce Eric Loomer. Uh, he's going to talk about personalization. Uh, he's been. Uh, doing research and, and then applying uh, what's going on in this field uh, for a number of years, and now he's doing it here at Gilt. Um, so, Eric? Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. It's a pleasure to have you all at Gilt. Um, as my co-named <laughs> host, Eric, mentioned, um, I've been in this space in one way or another for almost 20 years now. I started out in, in pure research, um, looking at, at math and algos and how to apply them initially to search engines, to distributed systems, to recommendation systems, then went into computer vision, then went into the real world and started a couple of companies and, uh, and landed at Gilt. And, and one of the things that um, motivated me to, to come to Gilt and, and I think really speaks to the difference between the, the current tech scene here in New York with respect to the, the West Coast is that a lot of the, the most interesting problems today are not so much about creating new tech, but they are really driven by new applications and, and how you can uh, use tech in new ways and in new contexts. And, and I think the, a lot of the, the business reality that you have in New York are, are really bringing new problems and new opportunities to, to use technology in interesting ways. And, and that was the main motivation for me to, to come to Gil because I think there's a, a whole new set of problems around uh, personalization, around recommendation that are very specific to the kind of business that uh, Gilt is, uh, is running. And um, that's hopefully uh, something that uh, I'll, I'll be able to convey tonight. So let me switch to... Um, the deck that I prepared. So really what, what I'd like to talk about is, is how do we um, power relevant discoveries. So, so really it's about uh, finding new things that you might be interested in, but that you were not necessarily expecting to, to see. And it, so it's really uh, about uh, the, the discovery word is, is really key, both in terms of what we do at Gilt and what we're trying to um, uh, to build with our personalization technology. Someone is trying to join the conference in remote. So the, let, let me say a few words about the, the magic of, uh, of flash sales and what makes the, the flash business unique. Um, so, as, as you may or may not know, really, uh, Gilt is in the business of, um, of so, the so-called so -called flash sales. They are sales that are proposed daily, that start at a fixed time, they start at noon uh, every day. 
they run for a, a finite amount of time, so typically between 36 hours and, um, and a, a couple of, uh, of days or so. And, um, and the idea is that every day new deals are, are proposed. So there's something about the, the novelty that every day there's something new that is going to be proposed. You don't necessarily know what's coming up. So there's always this sense of discovery. That's really a uh, sort of coupled with curation. So because it's something new and it's a limited quantity of new sales that are proposed, there's a, a, a large effort put into curating those sales and making them interesting and, and having creating a, an experience that is entertaining. And because those are typically about highly discounted uh, items that are in, in you know, in, square, in scarce quantity, there's a sense of urgency also. You're, you're hunting for the, uh, the new deal every day and to find the best bargains. So that, that sense of novelty and that sense of, of urgency is really what, what creates this high level of engagement that we're, we're seeing at Guild and uh, a much more frequent uh, visit rates on, uh, uh, on a site like Guild than you would typically see on, on a normal e-commerce site. And so when you combine novelty and urgency, what you get is, is really these, uh, these daily peak traffic. So you can see it. Uh, these are the, the number of visits uh, by R in the day average over, over uh, a certain number of days. And what you see is that there's, there's really a, a peak traffic ar around noon. And there's a second peak uh, around 9 because we're, we're starting some sales on Wednesdays and Sundays at, at 9 p.m. And so a lot of the engagement is around that time. And then there's a sort of background constant visit, but, but really people are rushing to find the best deals in, in specific in a short amount of time. So we, we have to, um, to react very quickly to, uh, to those visits and try to uh, propose interesting uh, variations on what's, uh, what's on sale on a given day, and we have to also try to, to distribute the traffic in, a, in an optimal way. So if you think of the, the traditional way uh, recommendation has been working and has been applied to, uh, to e-commerce in the past 20 years or so, I, I mean, the most the best known technique is, is what's called collaborative filtering. The term was, was coined by a guy that was sitting to desk from mine when I was in, in, um, at Xerox Park. So I'm, uh, Need this? Yeah. Is this better? Yeah, working. Um, so, um, so, so the basic idea is if you have a set of products that people can interact with and they can give either explicitly or implicitly uh, indications of preferences towards those products, things that they like, things that they don't like, you can look at the, the ratings or the, the feedback that a number of people are, are have given on those products and based on that make inferences for um, for new products that uh, people haven't rated yet and, and make suggestions and, and the basic idea you can do it two ways you can either take a, a user that is your target for which you're trying to make a, a prediction and look at the products that that user has already rated compared to the ratings for the same products from other people and look at the people that have the most similar ratings. So in this case, just to make it simple, you would look at, at this profile that has two likes in common. And so a reasonable guess for the opinion that this user might have for this product is, uh, is similar to what this user gave it. So <coughs> probably it will be a negative uh, rating. You can also do it uh, on a product basis, so by looking at different products and how um, those products were, pa couples of pairs of products were co-rated, you can find products that are most similar to a given product. And that's, that's what you're, I'm sure you're all familiar with in, in Amazon experience, where you'll be told, you know, people who liked this book also like these other books, and they are essentially contextually uh, showing similar similar items or items that might be correlated or to uh, the one that you're currently looking at, and so in that case, the the context is really provided by the the item that you're looking at, and based on all the co-purchases and co-browsing that people did, um, Amazon is going to suggest uh, items that are likely to be similar or related. So that's that's a classical collaborative filtering that works well when you have a catalog of products that is relatively stable over time so that you can assume that you have a, a, an unlimited inventory or supply of items and those items are around for a long period of time. And 
there's a large number of ratings available for each item. So you have what's called a, a dense matrix. We have those items are, are around for a long time and you have lots of data points uh, on uh, whether people like or don't like each one of those items, which allows you to, to build those correlations between uh, individuals or between products. Um, and you know, the, the dream cases for, uh, or domains for the standard technology are music and movies where you have items that stick around for a long time. They are uh, in infinite supply because it's very cheap, obviously, to, to deliver a copy of such items. And people interact with those very frequently. So you have lots of data points. We're in a, in a different space. So some of the challenges that are um, quite unique uh, to, to our domain uh, are, are listed here. So first, the, the products that we sell on Guild have a very uh, short shelf life. Typically, we're dealing with products that, um, that are available in limited supply because they are, they are discount items um, that, that we have in limited quantity. We're going to make them available for 36 hours. And then they might be, some of them might be gone forever. Some might come back in, in subsequent sales, but a good deal of those will, will be up uh, and available on the site for, for only uh, a finite amount of time. So you really don't have enough time to learn about the preference, the specific preferences for those products, uh, and at the same time recommend them to other people. Because by the time you learn um, the, the opinion that people have for those products and how they relate to other products, those products are, are likely to be sold out. So the, the, the classic technique that I, I just showed you of collaborative filtering is, is not really going to work well uh, in this case. Um, the second thing that is quite specific to, well, not specific, I guess, but that to which we uh, were giving a lot of attention is the fact that uh, Guilt is really a, a broad lifestyle um, shopping destination. And so really what we're trying to understand is uh, what are the, the lifestyle affinities that people have and so that we can generalize beyond the specific domains where uh, we, we know something about uh, our, our members' preferences. So let's say we, you've been traditionally buying a lot of, lot of clothes on, on Guild. We may not know anything about your, your restaurant preferences, your entertainment preferences, but um, in terms of, of actual purchases, but we still would like to be able to make some infer inferences and service uh, offers that we have on Guild City that you, you, you might be interested in. Uh, so there, there, there's this interesting problem of generalization across different domains and servicing things that are likely to be relevant but not necessarily expected and not necessarily in line with what you've uh, we've purchased before. The other thing is that um, in this space, what you've bought before is not necessarily a good predictor of um, of the fact that you're going to buy, want something similar in the future. And, and think of the typical example of buying a couch so if you just bought a couch, a couch, you're not likely to buy another one for the next two years or so. And so we don't want to uh, suggest to you tomorrow another couch and, and like some of our competitors do suggest that to you for the next 10 years uh, in each one of your, your emails. So there, there's a sense of, of changes in your interests and, and uh, a certain temporal relevance that, that we're trying to take into account. The third thing is that a lot of what we sell is, is about uh, style and stylistic preferences and, and aesthetic uh, taste. And these are really hard to capture. They're hard to describe um, and they are hard to, to map uh, to, uh, to user preferences. And so we're trying to leverage both uh, implicit stylistic attributes that relate to, uh, to the products we sell and uh, some explicit ones. And uh, finally, because we have this, this flash sale model where we're proposing different things every day and they're available for a finite uh, period of time, we, um, we have a little bit of a, a mismatch between what's available on a given day and what people might be interested in because not all our customers come every day on Guild. Whenever they, they happen to come, we might not have by default available what they are really interested in. And so we're trying to... Uh, a little bit uh, play with the, the rules of the, the flash model so that we can maximize the relevance of what's presented to a, a visitor when that visitor uh, arrives. And so that's really um, tracking what they, they've seen before and what, what they've been exposed to and what they're interested in 
and trying to make the, the, the content that is available more dynamic uh, for every single user. So let me tell you a little bit about how we're, we try to, to tackle some of those challenges. So, so obviously, we, 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 we try to build uh, preference profiles for, for our members. Um, a lot of that is derived from their behavior on the site. So we, because we're in a business where people come in uh, and, and scramble to find the best deal, buy something if they find it, and then get out, we're, we're not really set up to have our users spend a lot of time telling us what they are interested in and, and configuring their preferences. And in general, anyway, people don't like to do that too much online. So we're, we're trying to learn as much as possible from their behavior and, and based on, on uh, what we can derive from what they actually do on the site. Um, so a lot of the, the data that fills into uh, our user profiling are the actual user actions, the, the purchases they've made, um, the, the things that they've waitlisted, what they've added to their cards, the, the clicks that they do through our emails, uh, the visits that they do through all their browsing, their browsing patterns. Um, we're also trying to enrich that when, when uh, we have the possibility to do so with uh, third-party data, so things that we know from some demographic uh, information about the, the customers or if they connect with Facebook from their, their uh, Facebook profile data. Uh, and combining this information, we're, we're essentially uh, going from interactions with individual products to uh, preferences at a more abstract level. So we're trying to sort of abstract from single products to product attributes. And, and those are at different levels of abstraction. So we're, we're trying to learn what are the brands that people are interested in. And, and that's the first level of generalization, especially in the, in the fashion business, people tend to be relatively consistent in the, the brands that they buy into. We're trying to learn about the categories that people are interested in. So what are the specific categories that are interested in and what are the relationship between different categories so that we can make generalization. And then I'll, I'll, um, we obviously try to learn about, about sizes in our business. The, the size of, the, of the, the garments that you wear is, is obviously very important. And so we can, uh, when we suggest things, try to make sure that they are available in, uh, in your sizes. Um, we are creating opportunities for people to provide explicit feedback on the things they like and don't like, but we're trying to make that uh, contextual, and I, I'll come back to that. And obviously, as I mentioned, we're, we're looking at the temporal pattern of those interactions. So when you, you last looked at something or when you last bought something is obviously very important in terms of how likely you are to be uh, interested in the near future in a, in a similar or in a related uh, type of item. And it works both ways. So I gave you the example of the couch. If you just bought, bought a couch, you're very unlikely to, to want to buy another one in the very near future. But in some categories, if you just bought uh, a maternity dress, you might be interested in a pusher in a, in a few months' time. And so there, there are other categories where there's a, a positive correlation between one purchase and, and another one. And then there are some categories that are relatively constant um, because they are high frequency purchase categories. <laughs> okay, then essentially build on, on uh, based on, on those profiles that we're building and that are mapping uh, both from behavior and from explicit feedback, uh, your, your likely preferences, we try to build generalizations. And we can build generalization in, in many different ways. Uh, some generalization can go in the direction of being very consistent with what you've done before. And so essentially, it's a strategy of giving you more of the same. And that's typically what, what, what Amazon does, what Netflix does. And so the, the typical approach and to take a, a familiar movie example uh, or domain is, you know, if this is the target uh, user for which you're trying to make a, a, a recommendation, if that user has in the past uh, watched a, a couple of uh, horror movies, what you're going to do is uh, essentially based on other people that ha have watched the same movies, come up with other movies that are highly correlated and that are likely to be other horror movies, I think that this has gone off. Um, 
And so the, the typical recommender system will come up with other horror movies that are very similar in genre to the ones that you've already watched before, that you've rated positively. Um, if you try to broaden a user's horizon, one strategy is to try to be relevant, but as I said before, to sort of go in, in different domains or in, in, in affine domains. And so in this example, you can find movies that are related to the horror genre, but also crossovers with the comedy genre. So there are all these, these gore movies that are between the, the comic and, and, and the horror. And, and you could try to suggest instead a movie that is a little bit going on the edge of your, your typical domain, or really, or even crossover to a, a completely different domain uh, or a different category altogether. It's not movies, but then that might be related to books or to, to other categories. But if you're into horror, into science fiction, that might also apply to, to books or to other categories. And so that, that's closer a little bit to, to, what, uh, to the direction that we're currently moving and what we're trying to do uh, by getting uh, our, our users to explore more categories uh, across the, the whole guild um, offering. <coughs> So, so I mentioned also uh, style and, and um, you know, beyond, if you go beyond the sort of high level attributes of a product like the brand, the, the price level of that product, the category of that product, uh, there are more detailed and more subtle stylistic components of those products that have to do with the, the, the type of aesthetics and the way you, you sort of, uh, uh, the, 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 the general uh, genre of products that you like. So if we, if we look at, at um, garments, there are specific uh, things that have to do with the color of the garment, with the cut, whether it's a classic type of garment, whether it's more edgy, uh, whether it's more bohemian. And these are all things that you can, uh, an expert would be able to label manually, but in most of the case, uh, the case we don't have those manual labels. So what we're trying to do is leverage uh, the product descriptions that, that are really just a a set of uh, relatively um, un uncategorized attributes and from those extract implicit attributes of the garments. So things that uh, are not simple keywords or tags but that are um, that can be mapped to, to um, a series of values associated with the same uh, representative attributes. So for example we would, uh, we would extract automatically the style of dress that, that this particular dress corresponds to, uh, the type of, of neckline that is available, even some higher level uh, attributes that have to do with, uh, with the type of, of high level style, like bohemian or, or uh, classic, that, that a particular item is associated with. And this, this type of aesthetics can even, at a, at a higher level, can cross domains and, and, and apply to furniture that you might be, and design items that you might be uh, more, uh, a fine to and, and even to to the type of restaurants that you might like to uh, to go to. So, so these are the, the different levels that we we use in building our, our preference profiles, and then based on on those preference profiles that um, sort of capture what uh, user affinities in a, in a number of dimensions, so along brands, around categories, around price sensitivities, around stylistic. Uh, preferences, we, we use those with, uh, to feed some predator models and, and to come up with some scores for new products or new sales that users might be uh, exposed to. And so let me walk you through uh, a few areas where we're applying personalization uh, at Guild. So, so the first one is uh, in, our, in our email. So because it's a, it's a, uh, the flash sale business is one where you have new things being uh, proposed every day. It's very, it's very much um, a, a push-based model where every day we're sending uh, daily reminders by email or through mobile uh, push notifications that are going to drive a, a big share of the traffic to the site. And so given the limited real estate available in those emails and the limited attention that people have, um, it's really very important to decide what we're going to feature in those emails. And so we're creating completely different emails for for each, uh, each one of our, our members that receive those emails. And, and so every day we're sending millions of different, uh, of different personalized emails where, where we select 
the specific sales that are going to be featured in the email among the, the ones that are currently live. We change the specific content that is featured in the subject header. And all of those are going to increase the probability that a member might open an email, might click into a sale and visit the site, and, and therefore uh, uh, do a, a purchase on, on that given day. The other area is on the, on the, the site or, or the mobile apps themselves. We try to personalize the, the order in which content is, uh, is presented and the order in which content is surfaced. Because we, we sort of, we've grown over the, over the years and every day we have more sales across categories that users are going to uh, digest, that they are going to, to, to browse. It's really key to, to sort of try to surface things that they are most likely uh, to be interested in and to achieve a good balance between um, things that we know they've interacted with in the past and that they like and things that might be interesting to them because they are new and they are, they are just uh, fresh and things that they, they weren't uh, expecting to see and they, are, they might be open to, uh, uh, to purchase or shop into. And so one thing that we've been working on in the past few months is to create uh, a, a homepage with pre which prevent, presents a personalized overview of what's, uh, what's on sale at Guild. And every single user will see a, a different version of that homepage. So let's see if I can um, quickly give you a feel for how that plays out. So this is one version of the, the home page where we're, we're featuring um, you know, one, one, what we call a hero sale and then a number of, uh, of top picks. And then we organize additional sales that are featured for each store. So the women's store, the men's store, home store, um, and the baby store. And um, the actual sales that are featured and the order in which they are presented is uh, is really uh, personalized for each each visitor. So if I go here and let's see if I can do that. So if I change the the grid of the of the user and essentially force that that home page to be uh, applied to uh, to a different user, you see that there's a completely different uh, lineup that gets uh, presented on on the home page, and I can do that for any number of users, and just to give you a sense of the, the variety. So if I go and pick up another one, also that's the same one. So, so we're going with the same co content to provide a, a wide variety of different experiences and that are really tailored to, to each uh, individual user. So we've tried to go also beyond um, just presenting the content in a, in a different way and, and featuring different, a different subset for each user of the sales that are going live on a given day. And we've, we've started automating sales that are created completely algorithmically and they are generated uh, for and completely tailored for an individual user. And so the idea there is really to leverage the fact that since you're not coming every day when, or not all users are coming every day, when they do visit the site or, or open their mobile app, we want to, to try to also give them a chance to get the, uh, the best selection or the most relevant, relevant selection of what we have available in our inventory. And so we're going to make it blend completely in the, in the flash sale experience. So we're going to present a sale that lasts for, for, for 24 hours. Every day it's, it's a new one. And so there's this sense of novelty, there's this sense of uh, of time pressure and of scarcity, but it's uh, it's completely tailored to a, to a, um, a specific user, and so we've combined the um, the the profile information, the preference information, and matching that against the inventory with rules to create uh, the sense of novelty to craft a sale that feels like a normal flash sale, but that is made around a different featuring a different set of brands and around a different set of category every day. So, so every day there's a sense of surprise. You don't know what your personal sale is going to look like um, the next day. And so that drives re-engagement. It brings people to come back more often to the site. And it, it, it obviously um, is starting to, um, to create a, a relatively significant impact on the, on the business. Finally, we're, we're trying to close the loop with um, 
with the, the actual feedback of the user. So uh, as I said, we, we started by learning from what people do and have them essentially go about their normal business of, of shopping and exploring the content and, and try to derive from those activities what people are interested in. Um, but one thing that we, we know and that our users have been telling us is that they also want to have some level of control once they get engaged and hooked with uh, experiences that are tailored to their preferences. They want to be able to tell us uh, what they like and what they don't like, and especially what they don't like. So um, we, we have a lot of from the, the behavior, a lot of signals about what people are interested in. The hardest part is to learn from behavior what people don't like, because you, it's hard to, to, to make the difference between when you don't have a negative, an explicit negative feedback between simply not paying attention to something or actually disliking, actively disliking something. And so if, you're, if, you, if you miss on your recommendations, it's, it's really frustrating for, for a user to have something that doesn't really match their preferences and not being able to, to tell you that that's, that's not what they want. And so we, we've introduced this sort of uh, very lightweight contextual feedback where you can say, um, show me more, show me less products like that. And if you want, give, uh, give reasons why you want to, to see more or less products like that. So it's, it's either a very simple one-click gesture, or if you, you want optionally, you can give more specific reasons of what are the, the specific attributes of that product that make you want to see uh, more products like that or less products like that. And, uh, and that's something that we're in the process of, um, uh, of experimenting and prototyping. And so it should be available to more uh, guild members in the, in the coming few weeks. Um, the last example of what we're doing is in addition to, to completely algorithmically uh, automating some sales, we're, we're creating targeted sales, which is a little bit like, um, like ad displays. We, we have a, a large pool of sales that we can select from. And on, on a given visit, we're going to pick up a few sales that we think are more relevant for that specific vis visitors and blend them in the, in the mix of sales that are presented daily. And, and the idea, again, is to increase the relevance of what's available uh, on a given day. Some numbers, jo uh, just to give you a feeling of, of you know, what, we're, what we're processing and, and what we're producing. We're every day processing about, or reprocessing about 800 million activity rows. And so these are single events, like a user clicked on a, on a specific uh, uh, product detail page, purchased something, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, we are, uh, we're elaborating those activities into profiles, be retraining our, our models so that we can score products against uh, user preferences, and um, applying those, uh, those models to, uh, uh, to, to the personalization of the guilt experience where we're generating uh, double-digit revenue lift. So we're seeing that that has a, an actual incremental revenue impact uh, in the double-digit range. So it's, it's pretty significant in terms of what you can do with this, uh, this kind of approach. So that's basically all, all I had to say from in terms of the structure presentation. I wanted to, to give enough time for, for questions. So when you're looking at sort of those latent attributes in the description pages, are you breaking up? Um, are you searching for individual terms that you have to basically determine what those latent attributes are? Or are you regexing basically each word and seeing what rises at the top? Um, so it's closer to the to the latter. Um, so we're we're looking at, at n-grams, so they're not necessarily single words, but they can be single words or, or pairs of words or triplets. Um, and the problem is that those, is, those descriptions are very short and very uh, telegraphic types of descriptions. So um, normal, they're, they're not like normal documents where you would extract relevant tags by, by essentially splitting th those pieces of text into relevant units and doing things like TF, IDF, uh, waiting to, to look at the frequency uh, of each one of those terms and determine which ones are the, the most uh, discriminant. So things that are frequent enough to be useful, uh, characteristics of a range of documents, but not so frequent as to be trivial. 
So you have obviously words like the, is, etc. that are, that are uh, useless. In this domain, applying uh, statistical measures like TF IDF just doesn't work. It's going to pull out things that are um, that are not very meaning that 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 are not meaningful. Like you'll you'll have things like side zipper and that are not relevant characteristics in terms of uh, determ determining a, uh, a preference. So they are they are typically there in a product and they are part of the description, but they are not really related. Or, or useful from a, a preference standpoint. And so we had to, um, to take a different tack in terms of trying to automate the selection of what are relevant stylistic attributes. Um, and it, it's, it's really, it has to do with trying to figure out what, which one of those, um, those entities or those, those set of words make uh, is a good candidate for an attribute. And so it's looking at collections of uh, of n-grams that can all be associated with one type of attribute. And so we, we essentially apply the technique to find out what are good candidate attributes and uh, map then, uh, sort of pulled out all the, the n-grams that map to one given attribute or just different values or uh, attribute value pairs associated with, with a, a given attribute. And then um, select those as a way to filter what are relevant uh, n-grams that we want to use and, and extract from the, the descriptions. That means you need to manually identify those. No, no we're, we're using a, a, a heuristic to, to actually uh, automatically extract those attributes. We're, we're, we're doing some proofing of those and so both to validate that the method is, is correct and do some curation, but essentially the the bulk of the processing is, uh, is completely automated. Yeah. And then once you have those, you can essentially add those as metadata uh, to the products and map those to relevant <coughs> stylistic dimensions that people may have uh, preference for. Yep. So what's your technology stack look like? To I assume that there's a lot of pre-batching done to power most of these models. Yep. That's, that's so a good what's your stack look like? That's a good assumption. Um, Are you like a Hadoop shop or I know you use Mongo? So, so um, we, we have our own MapReduce uh, infrastructure. So we, we use Aster, which is a, a big warehouse on which we can run uh, MapReduce. Uh, we, we've We've played with some, some Hadoop setup, but until now we haven't had any a real need for it. Um, although we might soon be, be uh, using Hadoop as well. But essentially all of our, our raw data in terms of, of uh, clickstream data goes into, into Aster. We run our, our MapReduce jobs on top of, uh, of Aster and build our, our elaborates uh, from, uh, from, from there. Um, and then we, we use a number of uh, custom code and libraries to, to create our, our models and so to build inferences. So we rely on Mahout, for example, for some, uh, some of our, um, uh, our expansions and, and some form of collaborative filtering that we do at the, at the attribute level. But we've built our custom similarity measures and, and our custom uh, techniques, and we uh, we store some of those uh, pre-computed uh, sort of expanded profiles and uh, and sort of intermediary model uh, predictions into Mongo for the single user level. Well, are you good at load? Um, spend a bit on your infrastructure initial design seems to me that there's a point where marketing comes in or are you part of marketing and it can be personalized but then at the end you know all these emails can get kind of pick out. So is that part of marketing, it's part of visualization and you know to promise eight hundred uh, million rows right a day. Yeah. What does it take to do that in terms of personality and stuff? So so that, that all that processing is, is done automatically, so luckily <laughs> It, it, it doesn't require human beings, but uh, just uh, fast distributed processors. Um, and that's something that, that we're doing in, in uh, the sort of uh, 
minute range, so it's, it's relatively it's relatively fast. Um, we we are so we are in a, a sort of an interesting hybrid company in the sense that uh, Guild is very strongly um, editorially led, and so there's there's a very strong work of curation, um, and we we have uh, category experts that are involved in in uh, building sales around different th themes and and sort of setting the tr what the trends are, and so there Guild has a very strong voice in terms of suggesting what. Uh, it thinks is currently interesting in, in, in fashion, in, in the, the home business, etc. So a lot of what we do has has to do with blending those editorial inputs with what the algorithms are saying. And so we're trying to take into account um, the sort of the things that are featured ed editorially and give some space, give give a good mix or a good balance between the editorial uh, inputs in terms of what should be featured and what's the current story that is uh, being told or promoted uh, on a given day, with what the algorithms are saying about a specific individual users. Because obviously, when you're curating, uh, when a human being is curating those those sales or those those specific themes. Um, they are not doing that at the level of individual users. Does that does that address your question? Are you <coughs> sorry? Are you using a lot of uh, clustering techniques? And how easy is it to do so, um, easy, easy is that? So easy is relative. Uh, <laughs> so so. It's a question of different levels of personalization. So you, you can start from a, a level which is completely non-personalized and where where essentially you're giving the same thing to everybody, either based on, on um, human curation or based on overall popularity criteria. And so that's that's the top level, if you want, where, where you're giving the same thing to everybody. The other extreme is where you're building individual profiles. And so if you have enough data for a given user, you can have a profile that's completely individual. Obviously, that profile is enriched by what everybody else has been doing. So the, the, the essence of you know, all those uh, machine learning techniques is to, to use the, the overall statistics to make some inferences for an individual user. But the profile, the data that is input for that user into the model is, is completely individual. And so the recommendations that we're making are, are completely one-to-one. -one. But there's an intermediary level, which is um, a form of clustering, if you want, and that can be applied in two cases, and that we're applying in two cases. One is when we have, we don't have enough data about an individual user, so you might, for new members or people that have done very few interactions on the site, you might have only a few data points. They, those might be just basic demographic data where, where you live, um, some some other indicators of uh, you know, your gender, your age, whatever we we can uh, get from uh, from your sign up and and from external sources, um, and and those might be enough to do better than than non personalized, just to to map you to a cluster of people that are uh, have relative uh, relatively similar. Uh, macro characteristics, but for which we have a lot of behavioral data. And so that's one level where clustering is relevant is f when you have you don't have enough data to, to really do a good job at the, the completely individual level. And so what you want is to be relatively broad and generic, but you can do it at the segment level rather than doing it at the completely non-personalized level. The other level that is interesting is to uh, try to support uh, targeted Curation, and so it's where you you empower and support the the human curation, but rather than doing it at the completely non precise level, you start to do it for specific personas, so, so for specific types of, of shoppers. And so these are, in effect, segments. They are they are they are idealization of a certain uh, type of uh, of shopper, but the the number of such segments can be small enough that it is. Uh, practical and manageable and cost effective to start curating for those individual segments rather than doing generic uh, non non targeted type of sales how far you guys are really able to take this uh, 
personalization which is all done automatically. I mean, do you have to sometimes go and build in uh, manual or pseudo manual overrides where you're saying that, yeah, even though our rankings say that uh, this person should be targeted to these sales, but maybe we've been showing them too many of these sales, so we want to switch it up uh, with some sort of a manual override? Or, or does the model really work well that you don't need any manual intervention at all? So, uh, so we're not doing any manual intervention. Um, not necessarily because we don't need it, but, but simply because it's not scalable to do manual intervention, so we, we wouldn't know how to, how to do it. There are overrides, but typically they are more, um, they, they are not done to, to, to try to fix a single profile. They are more done to, to try to promote a specific theme which is not uh, at all captured by our, our data and by our algos. So for example, if you have um, the night of the Oscars, that's a, an external, that's an event, that's an external source of information for which we have no data. I mean, if we had 20 years of history, we could pick up that you know, around the, the night of the Oscars, certain type of dresses get sold, uh, but we, we, we're not there. I mean, we're, we'll, we'll never be there. And so I, so I think around, around specific events, there's an opportunity from a marketing standpoint and from a, uh, an editorial standpoint to promote and, and sort of raise the, 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 the interest around specific categories and specific themes. And, and those are, are typically editorially led and, and led by, by marketing considerations and those create overrides. Um, so, so basically, yeah, to, to a short answer is we don't do any manual override at the single profile level. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't do that, but really our game, everything uh, maybe I should have said is that Everything we do is A-B tested. And so for, for every single uh, type of personalization that we apply, we uh, look at the impact along certain metrics like conversion, like uh, revenue lifts, uh, like visit, revisit rates against a control that doesn't have that uh, personalization being applied. And so, for example, if I take the case of the, the emails, we can send emails that are not personalized, that are simply ordered by uh, a, mer a default merge choice, and we can compare uh, the behavior or the performance of a group of users that get those default emails with the performance of a group that gets uh, our emails that are algorithmically uh, reprocessed. And so the game is really to do, to do better than the control group and try to, do, uh, to get the, the highest lift that you can. So there's no sense of right or wrong, it, it's, it's, it's all relative, it's better, and, and it's clear that we can certainly do much better than what we're doing, but we don't know. It, th that's one of the key fundamental challenges or of, um, in the whole recommendation space is that it's very hard to define what the optimal is. There was an article in the paper today about phony web traffic, and I wonder how significant that is for you and how you deal with that. Uh, so I haven't read the article, but um, we, so all, all of our um, activity that we use for profiling is um, based on registered members. So Guilt is a, is a site where uh, if you don't sign up and you're, you're not a registered member, you're very limited in terms of, of the browsing you can do on the site. So I think that's one filter that we have is that all the traffic that is used to, to drive our profiling and to drive our models is based on post-registration activity. Um, and second, because um, the different types of activities have different valences, and in particular, purchases are obviously much more relevant than just a, a browsing click, although they are much less frequent. Um, that's a second type of validation or filtering is obviously purchases are not phony. And so we can look at um, certain types of activities that have a much higher reliability and, and give different weights to those in building our models. I've, I've read that there's been a, a significant increase in the incidence of uh, people who shop for others, I guess typically within a family or extended family, and that that's frustrated a lot of retailers and traditional marketing techniques of uh, targeting demographics and segments and stuff. And I'm wondering if 
that affects you at all? Uh, have you seen it, and would it even affect your model? Um, yes. So, so the short answer is is yes. We've we we've seen that a lot. Um, we we have. Um, I think the, the, the best uh, sort of test group that we have for, for that scenario are the guilt employees, because essentially, be, uh, since we, we, we have, we, we get guilt credits to, to buy on guilt and, and we get high discounts uh, to buy on guilt, um, pretty much every single employee account is a multi-user account because you, you, you buy for yourself, but your, your entire family uses your account and, and sometimes even your friends use your, your account. And so, so that you know, we have, we have a, a th at least a thousand users that we know are multi-user account. And then when we look at our, our entire membership, um, a lot of those, uh, those members are really um, shopping across multiple categories and they are clearly shopping cross gender so they're shopping for themselves and for others sometimes as gifting and sometimes it, it means that it, behind that account there are multiple people um, so i think there, there are two different situations one in which it doesn't matter in the sense that just means that that profile is composed of multiple categories and and you can cover those different categories in in their relative proportions and, and frequency and weights in terms of, uh, of purchases. Sometimes it, it does matter in the sense that, you know, when I'm saying I'm making a personal sale for you, there's something particular about who that you is. It's, it's not a generic you, but it's, it's going to res resonate with a single um, individual. And so we're, we're, we're trying to think about that in, in some specific uh, parts of the product where we apply personalization but yeah it, it is a it is a fundamental challenge and it, it's um, it's one that also the the tv recommender systems have where you know behind the family account there are obviously multiple users that are watching different kinds of programs and and you have to try to figure out based on the the time of the day which user you might be dealing with uh, or make it explicit let you let people divide that account in multiple owners and, and associate different profiles. So, yep. Can you talk about when as a business Gilt was prepared to take on these personalization efforts? Or if that was something that really started at the forefront of the inception of the business? Um, no, I, I think it's something that um, Gilt has, has been doing for a long time at some level. Um, but the, the real sort of strong push around personalization started ab around uh, 18 months ago. Um, and, and I think there are two, two big factors uh, that have been driving that sort of increased investment around personalization. One is obviously reaching a, a critical size in terms of no, number of users, so where you have enough data and enough uh, different types of members that it, it becomes really relevant. Um, especially as, as guilt has grown also internationally and you start having really uh, different demographics and different taste regions uh, altogether. Um, and I think the second driver has been the, the, the expansion in the categories that guilt has been supporting. So guilt really started out as a, as a fashion business and so it was pretty narrowly defined around major brands in the, in the fashion industry, mostly women's fashion. And then it has been expanding gradually across multiple categories, so going into the home business, going into travel, going into uh, local deals. And so that, that sort of has increased the, the, the range of offers. And it's because of that sort of flash sale and, and short duration, it's much more that people can typically di digest in, uh, in a single visit. On a single visit, people are typically going to go uh, visit three, four sales at a time out of the 80 or 100 that are available. And so it becomes really, really key to sort of the, the most uh, relevant ones, uh, because as you click through those sales, you know, after three or four clicks, that user is gone. Can you talk a little bit more about how you uh, refine the algorithm as you go along? So you talked about um, benchmarking against control groups. But how do you, sort of, once you've obviously established the algorithm, how do you further refine that and work out whether those refinements are, are working or not? 
So um, there are essentially two, two ways we, we improve the, the algos. One is by training them and testing them on historical data. And so that's the sort of the first cut that we can apply to try to get in the right ballpark. And so we can essentially look at, at historical data, take all the data available up to a certain point in time and, and use that to build profiles and train the models and then look at, at uh, a subsequent period of time and establish targets like what's the likelihood that people will click into an email and visit the site or will, will make a purchase and, and try to maximize those, uh, the, those events based on the predictions that we were making. Um, and so that, that helps us uh, refine our models and try to get in the, the right ballpark. And then ultimately, when we think we have um, a good candidate to test against our current model, we, we, we A-B test it. We just, uh, we just run different variants against each other and, and uh, compare the performance. But how large a proportion of your user base do you test be testing in Oh, it, it really depends, but it's, it's, it can go between the single digit uh, percentages of the user base to 10, 20 percent when we're testing. And then, and then from there, usually once we, we, we're confident that we have a good, um, uh, a good new candidate, we roll it out to a, a much larger part of our population. And briefly, how long does that process take? So the A-B testing is a uh, rule of thumb is, is 30 days. 30 days? Yeah, to get significance. Okay. And it's really a trade-off between how large uh, uh, um, a percentage of the population you're exposing it to and how many days it's going to take. Um, so it really depends on some, some things that are more implicit and where they are less likely to have a major impact or may possibly a negative impact, we can roll them out to a larger population and maybe test them and, and get results much faster. So let's say we decide that we want to, to change the color of a button to remove uh, an ad box. These are things that you can test very quickly because you can just roll them out to 50%. Nobody notices it if it, if it goes one way or, or the other. And you, if you put it back to how it was before, and, and so you can test those on, faster, on a faster cycle. When we're testing a new feature that you would really notice and that changes your experience fundamentally and that can have a potentially a, a big uh, disruptive impacts, we, we test them on a smaller percentage and, and that takes longer. Sorry, let's... Talk about personalization and the impact it has to the revenue. In terms of, like, if you looked across your different segments, did you find any places, any particular segments where they actually had a negative impact? Like, was there any situation where something was maybe overly first? Like, is there such thing as over personalization? Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, there, there's potentially uh, such thing as over personalization. I mean, for sure, you can, um, you can create those bubbles where, where you tend to have things that are very repetitive. And, um, and that's something that, that we, we pay attention to. Um, I think the bigger risk is, which is a little bit the, compl the, the complement to overpersonalization, is missing out. And so um, we have situations where we're sort of missing out on very interesting sales because we're not, our algos are not picking them up, picking them up well enough. And um, some examples are new, new brands um, so we, if you have a new brand that shows up, you don't have any data point. And initially we would just not do anything special about that. And so those sales would be, would get completely dumped in the, in the personalization drop because there's no, there's no relevance that it gets associated to those. Um, and so we started, uh, treating very specifically new brands and, and, and sort of bootstrapping their, their presence in the, in the taste graph, if you want. Um, other areas where we have to be a little bit careful are with um, very expensive items. So these are also items that tend to have a low frequency of purchase, but they have a very big impact on, on revenue. 
and so sometimes you you, you have to treat them uh, in a in a different way than you would for items that tend to be sort of average frequency and average price point. Um, and then the, the final case that, that comes to mind is um, when we're really changing the experience in a way that tries to, to promote the breadth of what Guild has to offer. And we're doing that um, so that it, it sort of drives more people to, to uh, increase the, the range of categories that they shop into. But that's going to have a negative in impact on the, the sub-segments that are really single category shoppers. Uh, so, you know, if you're, if you're 20 and, and single and uh, sharing your apartment with other, uh, other, other people, you might not buy for your home, you're, you might not buy for kids, you might not buy for a partner, and so all those categories you might not care about. And so we've done things where we've, with really the, 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 uh, the explicit objective of trying to uh, give a broader exposure to all that Guild has to offer. Overall, it, 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 it provides a, a positive benefit. We think in terms of positioning, it's a good thing to do, but there are some segments that, that really uh, react negatively to that because it just adds more clicks for them to get at the things that they're actually interested in. Yep. Can you shed some light on what it takes to keep the system running? I assume a lot of creative has to be produced every day. All these products and images need to be tagged with certain dimensions so that your algorithms actually know what to serve up to a certain person. So how big is that group of people and how much work goes into feeding the beast, basically? So, um, so a lot of work. I mean, all of that work is being done regardless of personalization. We're, we're really just trying to leverage what we can leverage that is already available because it's actually so much work that trying to get that work done specifically to improve personalization is, is challenging from a, just from an organizational point of view. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's a very big part of, of what Guild does. I mean, just to, to give you an idea, I think the, the biggest uh, employer of um, photo shoots in, in New York is, is Guild. We, we have the studios in Brooklyn in the, the Navy Yard and they, they employ the, the largest number of, uh, of models and of uh, photographers. So there's a lot of work that is being done in the curation uh, visually of the content that is put on Guild and that's part of the, the positioning of Guild is in this sort of lux luxury high quality space and, and um, there's a lot of work that is invested in the the manual data entry around the, the, the basic descriptions of the products, and even more so in the in the creation of the sales. So both edit from a, a, a creative standpoint and from a, um, a stylistic or fashion standpoint, we, we have uh, half of the floor that is occupied by merch people that, that create those sales. And so really what we've been working on um, in the past year or so is to keep or leverage all the good things about that, that curation work, but um, build a platform that, that can make that, that approach highly scalable. And so all our effort, uh, and it goes really beyond personalization, but I think it's, it's in part enabled by personalization is to scale up the business model in a way that is cost effective. Yep. Is personalization within your mobile app any different than the one um, on your phone? Um, yeah, there are some differences. I mean, it's, um, a good deal of what we do is common between between the apps, um, but there are some differences. One reason is practical in the sense that there are some features that we're not releasing, and some some structure of the of the of the the applications are different between mobile and and web. So certain things work well uh, on the web and not, and not on mobile, and vice versa. And then uh, the other is that there are some differences that we're starting to uh, to take into account in um, the the shopping behavior on mobile and on and on the web. So certain categories uh, are sold more easily on on iPhone apps and are uh, have higher conversion. And so we're trying to take the channel into account in the personalization as well. Do you identify some members as as being particularly high value? Do things for them explicitly? Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So, so we have those uh, 
those customers are called noir customer and they, they are this um, this very high value high spending uh, customers um, they they are in the single digit number but they they account disproportionately for our revenues um, and we're we're doing certain things so from a, an algo standpoint we obviously try to uh, to make sure that we're not uh, uh, creating some fatigue or some damage on that on that segment there's a tendency with with uh, any kind of algos to pick up the sort of the broad statistical regularities and so that you know, if you have a distribution that picks up the the mainstream uh, those edge cases might actually end up seeing more high frequency mainstream products and less of those very high sp high price porn exclusive <laughs> items and and so feel like the like Gil's branding is being diluted and so we're trying to think about that make sure that we're not um, losing their their uh, their engagement and see how we can also buy us for for price point and for, uh, in our models so that's one thing that we're currently looking at because it's, it's I mean it's really particular if you buy diamonds you want to see those, but you're not buying them very frequently. Whereas if you buy uh, a shirt, you can buy a shirt you know, every other day. And so in the typical models, that that category is going to be boosted mm -hmm. just because it's higher frequency, but it doesn't mean that it brings more revenue overall. Um, the other thing we do with those noir customers is to have a dedicated um, customer support and have a sort of human personalization with uh, with uh, dedicated CS that are acting as concierge and that can call them up, suggest specific things that are coming up and, and follow them differently. Yep. Uh, is it possible uh, for you to provide some uh, insights you learn from all your database to the brands, manufacturers, designers to boost their innovation? Yes. <laughs> um, so that, that that that's a very interesting area and and one that in terms of of building and strengthening the relationship with uh, with those brands, um, it it started out so Guild started out as as an online outlet, and so the whole flash sale model was around buying big brands at great discounts and uh, exploded in the in the, um, the crisis years where a lot of those vendors had uh, excess inventory. And so their main interest was to get rid of, of excess merchandise. I think they're gradually, there's still an interest to, to sort of um, use the online channels and use guilt in particular um, for, uh, for sales and to, to, to get rid of excess inventory uh, without damaging the brand. So, so I think Guild is a great channel to do that for those those uh, high-end brands because they do that, but in a way that doesn't really cannibalize their their brand value and their their normal prices. Um, but more and more, they are really interested in also using Guild as a marketing platform, as a way to learn more about uh, which products go don't go, what segments are are interested in their products, how how can they reach specific segments, and, and so so huge uh, huge opportunity there. Yep. Uh, when you come with updates for your algorithm, uh, where do the ideas come from? Is it data driven? Is it human input? Um, so you would think that it's all data driven <coughs> because that's the whole philosophy of big data and data driven. The reality is that it's a little bit of both. I, I think you work a lot by insights and hypotheses. Um, and, uh, and then there's a part of, of data analysis and exploration where you try to val validate those insights and see if there's some opportunity. And there's a very, there is to some extent a creative work in, in modeling certain, uh, certain relationship between a certain feature and, and, uh, and, and relevance or probabilities of, of having a certain action. So, so it, it, it is a mix. It's a mix of, of what the data says on its own and what hypothesis you can form and then go uh, go back to the data and, and test those hypotheses. And is it usually like the marketing department or do you get a bunch of designers or how, how does the process, can you shed some light on um, the process? 
So from a, a data modeling point of view, it's really it's a bunch of nerds that are doing that. I mean, it's it's my team and uh, and uh, people in the in the data engineering team and and, uh, and myself. I think the the interesting thing is that personalization and, and recommendation is part data and science by this part product and so i think to have good recommendations is not just based on the quality of your data and your models um, especially if you go in the range in the realms of explicit recommendations it's a lot about the way you 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 present that and so that uh, crafting of the product and how we we create uh, personalized recommendations when they are explicit uh, is really uh, driven by um, by how we think of the product and that's getting inputs from uh, from everybody um, so from marketing from from user experience people uh, from merchandising the other thing is that I, I mentioned in the in the personal sales um, that we're, we're really trying not just to, to come up with recommendations of oh this is something you might like but actually to give that sense of proposing every day a new sale that feels like an interesting collection of things. And, um, and that's a lot about trying to capture the expert rules of the, the merchandisers. And so there's a lot of input that is coming from the merchandisers about the, you know, just the, the rules of what works well together, what makes for a, a, a coherent set of merchandise that you can propose together. And, and so these are things where we we're really trying to sort of uh, reverse engineer <coughs> the, um, all the heuristics that uh, merchandisers use. I'm just curious about the KPIs. Are there some specific KPIs used to measure personalization? Um, yeah, I mean, the, so the, the <laughs> basic one uh, that we use is, uh, is conversion. So we're, we're typically looking at the impact of personalization on conversion, so it's it's orders over over visit, um, but we're also looking at at uh, related KPIs, so things like uh, engagement, and so how often you 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 come to the site, um, and then impact on uh, on revenues, which is obviously revenues and margins are are the real KPIs. So the thing about conversion is that if you have very different price points, you can get people to convert a lot on socks, uh, and so they they're going to you're going to to increase your your conversion KPI and it looks fantastic, but your revenues are actually going down. So. We have one last question. Yep. Do you update your models in stream? So as the person clicks on <coughs> the website, or is it mostly sort of done overnight or sort of on a more regular basis? So it's, it's mostly done overnight. Okay. It's mostly done on, on a 24-hour cycle. Um, but there are some exceptions, and, and those exceptions are becoming a uh, more and more of a reality. So obviously, there are, there are several cases, but, it, but it's basically everything that has to do with what happens within a session and, and how you want to react to what happens within a session at that moment. And so, um, let's say you just search for something. That's that's more an expression of uh, not of your taste, but of your intent of what you're currently looking for. And so, that's something that we have to take into account at the moment. Or if you're a new member, um, the first few clicks are really important in in making the difference between someone who's going to convert or come back, or someone who will just do a, a first pass and never come back to build. And so, there again, you have to react fast. Um, and how do you do that technically? To be able to react so quickly? Some of these recommenders take a while. To yeah, so, so you, you cannot change the, the overall model, but you can change more rapidly the profile. Yeah. And so what's, what's, uh, what's a relevant input in the profile? And so you, you're trying to combine the historical part of the profile with more recent contextual data. And, um, and so it's, it's really, if you want having two, two streams, one is the click stream that goes into uh, a slow processing cycle uh, that is typically a, a daily cycle and one uh, the same click stream that goes through a fast processing cycle and is just specifically looking for a certain ev a subset of the events so sorry personalized prices. no we don't 
I mean, there, there are lots of legal um, issues around precising prices. Thank you very much. Thank you.